to tonight's presentation. This is our seventh in a series on the Manhattan Forum in anticipation of our conference on 18th September in the Missouri Parish in Danville, where we'll have an all-day conference on the Manhattan Declaration. Tonight's featured speaker is Mr. William B. May. Chairman for the Catholics for the Common Good. Mr. May is the founder and chairman of Catholics for the Common Good, a lay apostolate for the evangelization of, uh, evangelization of culture. He is uh, an active promoter and supporter of the sanctity and proper understanding of marriage. He is a great voice in the public square on behalf of our church's teachings on these matters. In the Manhattan Forum lecture series, we try to keep introductions to a minimum so that we can have plenty of time to hear our speakers, but also after the presentation, to have questions and answers. The topic for tonight from Mr. May is marriage and children, reshaping the dialogue to reflect the human reality. I would like to have you all please welcome Mr. William B. May. Thanks very much. Thanks, uh, Steve. You know, when you said I was a, a promoter and advocate I, of, I thought you were going to say St. Anthony of Padua Institute, because I really am. Um, I think you all are doing wonderful work, and it's quite an honor to be uh, to be invited here tonight. Uh, we uh, Catholics for the Common Good really appreciates the, uh, the the friendship and association, and and the resources that you bring to the community on important issues like the Manhattan Declaration. Um, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Steve Courtright's not here tonight. He's also an advisor for Catholics for the Common Good, and and uh, and as I've learned so much from Steve, and so grateful. Uh, learned about social teachings, principles of social teachings. But, but one of the one of the things that that he has really helped me understand more than he knows is the importance of of words and nuances. As as uh, I went to a lecture series once where he. Uh, it was on Deus Caritas S, where he, he, he read the German, the Latin, and the English, and then he compared the words and the nuances to try to get at the, at the, uh, at the real heart of the meaning of the, uh, of the author, uh, Pope Benedict. And, uh, and since then, I've really been, been attuned. And, uh, and, and Cliff Price and Mary Price were so grateful. You know, they, they helped launch Catholics for the Common Good and, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, setting up our first website. And we're, uh, we're just, you know, their generosity and, uh, and support has, has just been wonderful over the years. Um, you know, this is, this is a wonderful series, uh, and, uh, and I've, I've followed it closely, although I've not uh, been able to attend all of the lectures, but I, but I have um, heard most of them or watched most of them on the, uh, on the internet, and uh, just a, a, a lot of outstanding things that are coming to this. Um, Steve uh, Kurtwright and Steve Cordova had asked me to talk about <clears throat> uh, the, the the lessons of Prop 8 and and where do we go from here and um, and it, it just happens that Catholics for the Common Good is as um, actually we started before Prop 8 uh, working with the Catholic Con Conference in in developing a whole new strategy a whole new approach to issues related to marriage and family. And, uh, and uh, we are, have been busy uh, with a, uh, a formation and training program and building a team and building an army for evangelization of, of culture around the state. Um, <clears throat> you know, the reaction that I get from a lot of people is, boy, we sure dodged a bullet with Prop 8. And uh, it passed. We, we restored the definition of marriage between man and woman in California. And we put it into the Constitution. Um, and, uh, and, you know, let's just relax, call us if there's another initiative. What they, what they don't recognize is that as Ernest Perucci, uh, a senior fellow of Catholics for the Common Good and one of the speakers in, in the series talking, came to talk about the legal aspects, all the passage of Prop 8 
uh, did, well, it, it was significant, but what it did was it permitted us to continue to have the debate on marriage without being discriminatory under the law. Uh, in fact, had Prop 8 not passed, we might have been, might have been meeting in another place tonight because parishes that make their facilities available to, uh, to outside organizations, like St. Anthony Padua Institute, uh, would have to make it available to anybody who came. And uh, a same-sex couple who, uh, who, who might want to have a reception or, 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 or uh, some event here. And uh, I, was in a, I was doing a TV debate with uh, Kate Kendall of the National Center for Lesbian Rights, and I, and I explained this to the host on the, on the TV show, and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, she said, Kate, is that right? And Kate very coldly said, anyone who discriminates should be sued. So essentially, it would have the effect of isolating Catholic parishes and, and any other organization that did not recognize uh, uh, same-sex marriage or only recognizes uh, the reality of marriage between a man and a woman. But since Prop 8, um, uh, you know, uh, same-sex marriage has, has become uh, uh, legal in Connecticut, in Iowa, New Hampshire, Vermont, Washington, D.C. It was in Maine for a while, and, uh, <clears throat> and the voters there were able to do the same thing we did here in California. And, uh, and um, uh, it's um, in Washington, when it was passed there, the citizens uh, 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 passed around an initiative, and when they presented it, uh, a non-elected commission uh, decided that just the initiative on its face, which had the same wording as Prop 8 in California, was discriminatory under the Human Rights Act uh, for, for D.C. and prohibited uh, uh, it from going before, before the voters. So far, the courts have upheld them, and uh, it's, uh, it's probably going to the Supreme Court yet. The Manhattan Declaration, though, <clears throat> uh, properly said the impulse to redefine marriage in order to recognize same-sex and multi-partner relationships is a symptom rather than the cause of the erosion of, of the marriage culture. It reflects a loss of understanding of the meaning of marriage as embodied in our civil and religious law and in the philosophical tradition that contributed to shaping the law. This is really important because what people don't realize is that while it's not redefined in the law in California and in other places, it is redefined in the minds of many, many people, an increasing number of people, particularly young people, as they, as they come out of schools. 30 years ago, it would have been unbelievable to have this, this kind of a debate, uh, even to, uh, to gay rights organizations. Uh, I've talked to people within the movement, and, uh, and, and they said, that, well, we're just shocked that we're here. And uh, we never would have conceived this years ago. But, uh, but we need to wake up in a sense of urgency and understand what is going on here and what we need to be doing something about it. Now tonight I'm gonna to share with you some things that may sound a little counterintuitive. Our approach is a very, very different approach. But I wanted to, I wanted to, to, to focus on three areas tonight. One is we need to stop being distracted by opponents. And, uh, and, and, and focus on the consequences for society and our families. We need to clarify the issues. Uh, there, as, I, as I will discuss, there is a lot more to this than lifestyles and, and things of that sort. Secondly, <clears throat> fewer and fewer people understand the words that we use when we talk about marriage and family. 